Sure. Well, well, thank you for uh, having me come and uh, speak to this topic. Uh, as you can see, I, I, I wear several hats. Uh, I've, ju I've just come from the Ottawa Hospital and I'm driving on to Cornwall and uh, past the Winchester Clinic, so I move around a fair bit. I see a lot of people have falls and just by necessity I, I've developed an approach to falls. I've had to adapt it for the algorithm, but all of the elements are in there. So even though I went through internal medicine, geriatric medicine training, I wasn't given a comprehensive approach to the assessment of falls. So if you're feeling like you didn't get that education, you're not alone. We're all really in the same boat. So just to highlight how important falls are, it's estimated one in three seniors are likely to fall at least once per year. So high, high volume. It's the most common cause of injury and the sixth leading cause of death for seniors. That's something many people don't know. So not only is it common, but it's very dangerous. Uh, every 10 minutes, at least one older adult visits the emergency department due to falls. So this is a really an emergency department diversion strategy, trying to prevent admissions to hospital, prevent presentations to uh, emergency departments. And despite that, every 30 minutes in Ontario, one older adult is admitted to hospital with a fall. So it's a big flow issue for hospitals. And when people fall, many of them don't recover fully or take a long time to recover. And really, if you look at the overall um, economics, falls are the leading cause of overall injury costs in Canada. So $6.2 billion, or 31% of total costs for injuries. So this is a high volume, uh, very dangerous, very expensive issue that unfortunately we haven't really been trained to fully assess or to assess comprehensively, and we haven't put adequate systems in place to deal with this. So I, I commend the Ministry on of health and trying to get a fall strategy up and running and pilots like this are going to be key to developing that strategy so we're going to be asking you for a lot of uh, feedback and a lot of input on where the strategy goes from here on in so you are drivers of change in terms of being an expert in falls I'm going to start by contradicting Jane there are no experts in falls there are a lot of students some of us have studied a bit longer really students so the good news is about one-third of uh, fall-related adverse outcomes are preventable, so it's not as bleak as the previous slides suggested. And I would suggest uh, employing a vital sign concept. If someone has not been falling or having near falls and they're starting to have near falls or falls, something medical has changed. They've been put on a new medication or they have a new medical condition. So think of it the way you would a temperature, a high respiratory status, uh, a very fast heart rate. It means something has happened medically, so that's a whole different way to, to look at falls. So if your patient starts falling, something has happened, you need to start examining them. How to examine them is, is pretty complicated. So why, why is it so complicated? Why is it so difficult to assess? Aside from the, the last point that it's really not a part of our, um, our medical curriculum. Number one, just standing upright is a very unnatural position. There are no other mammals that spend their, li their lives on their hind legs trotting around. Human beings are the only mammals to the best of my knowledge, that do that. At one of these presentations, I'm sure I'll be corrected and there'll be some rare animal that, that does. Um, and so, fall, so balance requires very complex integration of the cardiovascular system and the neurological system. And that type of high-level integration can be tipped over by multiple problems, vertigo, strokes, cardiac issues, neurological issues, neck disorders, physical deconditioning, medication, the list goes on. The causes really cover about eight to nine medical specialties and you're gonna see there's about 150 to 200 causes of falls. So this is a very, very complex area, probably one of the most uh, complex clinical areas around. So you've all seen the algorithm. Uh, what we realized as we worked on this algorithm and put it together, the, the yellow boxes uh, are drawn from the American Geriatric Society and British Geriatric Society um, consensus guidelines. <clears throat> and what we realized are two things. Number one, the content was very good, especially box five, but what was missing is the guidelines didn't describe how you would assess medications, how you would assess postural hypotension. They lacked the actual um, instructions regarding how you assess any of these. It was just assumed everyone knows how. And I'm not sure everyone knows how to assess each and every one of these. The other thing we noticed is in previous guidelines, some of the most common things were lower down on the list. So really the first thing you should be checking is postural blood pressure and medications, and those were lower down on the list. So while we didn't change the population of the box, we did change the order so the highest yield items are at the very top and you're gonna to get to them first.
and you'll have to tell us if, if that was a good approach after the pilot is done. Uh, you've seen the uh, multifactorial risk assessment for falls page that's been part of the, the workshops and the state independent checklist. So I won't go over those. So I will be focusing on box five and by virtue of the fact that the interventions box six come out of what you find in box five, consider it kind of a joint presentation. But it really I'm going to be walking through box five one step at a time and that, that really represents the um, uh, the overall um, outline for the talk. So, as I said, we, we took the guidelines, we changed the, the order based on patients we've seen. We see about 2,000 people with geriatric outreach per year and that many of them are falling, so we get a sense of what's common and what's less common. Uh, but really do view this as a, as a process that you're involved in refining. So this is box five, and I'm good, I highlighted in red the three things that come up again and again and again when I review cases with the geriatric assessment outreach teams. One is medications that cause falls. It, it's incredible how many people we just have to ask the family physician to adjust one or two medications and their falls at least decrease in frequency. But you're going to see the list is not one that's really manageable just by physicians. We probably need pharmacists to become more involved in this initiative. Number two, postural hypotension. Very, very common, but doing supine versus standing blood pressures is not something we do routinely in medicine. Even in acute care, it's not being done. Even in patients on dialysis in, in hospital, it's not being done, even though they're having two, three liters of fluid removed. So it's a real gap in medical evaluation. And the third red, red area is pain. We see a lot of people on geriatric outreach who are not walking well because of pain control. When you control the pain, they're already walking much better and falling less when they get to our geriatric day hospitals. So if you looked at that, those would be three, three high uh, volume, high ticket items to not forget about. But we're going to walk through these one by one. You're going to see how complicated it is and why you really need a checklist to scan through. If you know your patients, you'll be able to walk through this very comprehensive list a lot faster than if you've never met the patient before because you'll know what you can rule out very quickly. So in terms of medications, I'm going to give you a couple of slides, different ways to slice this problem. Number one is look at these five categories. So any medications that are deliriogenic, uh, that, if that's a word, that's low mentation, so those would be narcotics, benzodiazepines, alcohol, the anticholinergics, ditropan and detrol, and the tricyclic antidepressants. All of those can cause delirium. When people are delirious, they fall, break their hip, hit their head, have uh, uh, acquired brain injuries. So that's one category to look at immediately if someone's falling. The next are medications that drop your blood pressure uh, when you go from lying to standing. I'm going to flesh this out further in another slide, but when I looked at the large body of medications, it took a while, but it, they seem to fall into these categories, and I call them all the antis, the antihypertensives, the antianginals, anti-Parkinsonian medications like Cinemet, antidepressants, the tricyclic antidepressants, uh, the anticholinergic ones, antipsychotics, uh, which are very anticholinergic, and the anti-BPH medications. Hytrin and Flomax can both drop blood pressure precipitously. Hytrin used to be a blood pressure medication before it was used for prostate. I have seen uh, several men pass out on these medications. They're very, very powerful. Then the third category would be drugs that slow patients down and make them rigid and Parkinsonian. Those would be the antipsychotics. And then two gastrointestinal drugs, Stematil and Maxran. Stematil is an old antipsychotic that's now used for nausea. And Maxran is a motility agent. So those are medications you don't want someone to be on if they're already a little bit stiff and Parkinsonian. Number four, vestibular toxicity, so high dose aminoglycosides like um, gentamicin, um, the, uh, that happens rarely, and high-dose loop diuretics like furosemide. More commonly, I should probably move SSRIs up on the list. There's a, body, a fairly large body of evidence linking SSRIs to falls, and I'm not really certain of the mechanism, but just be aware of that. You can slice this differently and focus just on delirium, and I've mentioned many of these, the deliriogenic drugs, benzos, narcotics, alcohol, antihistamines, so don't forget to ask what people are taking over the counter that they may not tell you about. People take antihistamines to help them get to sleep, and they can certainly contribute to falls, and many people fall when they get up and go to the washroom in the dark at night. The neuroleptics we've talked about, anti-seizure medication, so the anticonvulsants. All of them seem to affect the brain and often the cerebellum when the doses are in the, in the mid to high range so this would be Dilantin or Phenytoin, Gabapentin, Pregabalin, so medications that we use for pain control, for chronic pain. Uh, one example in, in terms of how you have to look at the levels, not just the drug, is Dilantin. 
The therapeutic range when you look for Dilantin is 40 to 80. Seniors, when you go from 60 to 80, are actually somewhat Dilantin toxic. They get confused and they start falling down. So what we generally recommend is if the person's never been on Dilantin before and they're on it for seizure control, aim for a level of 40 to 60, 40 to 50 if you can. If they've been on it before, find out from their neurologist or the family doctor what level are their seizures controlled at. Some people have their seizures controlled at 20. So the lower boundary of the therapeutic range is really meaningless. You can go below the 40 and still have good seizure control. So find out what has worked for that person before. And if their album is very low, don't forget to get a free Dilantin level. Then anticholinergics. This is a really difficult area, problematic area, because physicians, Generally, we don't have a, a strong sense of all the medications that have anticholinergic properties. And when I look at the next slide, it's just daunting. You know, I, I don't think there's any way I can really work through a slide like this. I, it's nice to keep it up, to keep it maybe up on my office wall, but it's a very hard slide to work through. And it is incredible. There are a lot of drugs like Gravol that we don't think of as anticholinergic, but they are. And it might not be the one drug, it might be the overall anticholinergic load. As you're on a few mild anticholinergic, it might start to build up and build up. So how do you deal with a, a list like that? Well, first of all, I would go back. You know, you should be looking at the common culprits. So the, the, the ones on this page are the common culprits. Look for those medications. If you're not sure if there are other drugs and you really want to be comprehensive, look for a time-based relationship. So did the person become confused or start having near falls or falls after a medication was started or after a dose was increased? So that's a bit of a telltale sign. The other thing we don't do very well is we don't use pharmacists optimally. You know, as pharmacists are doing med checks and doing a general review, I think where I find them really, really helpful is if I have a patient who is slightly delirious, confused, or is having near falls or falls. And I'll write that, I'll write a letter to the pharmacist, this person is having falls, could you please list all their medications that could be contributing to the falls? If from the most likely to the least likely, I get fantastic letters back from the pharmacists. And then I can work through it. I can, I can decide which medications are optional, which ones I can try to decrease in dose or stop, and which ones I cannot touch because the person's medical conditions would uh, really go out of control. So I think that's a partnership that we haven't really established, uh, what I would call strategic deprescribing, working with the pharmacists and having them do a problem-based med checks based on falls, confusion, ur uh, urinary incontinence, uh, loss of appetite. That's something we don't do very well and I think it's something the province needs to look at as, as a new approach.